March order, we have a uh, forum here. Uh, Ms. Vicks is unable to join us this evening, but everybody else is here. I can extend a warm welcome to those of you who are here this evening. Appreciate y'all being here, including anybody that's uh, watching us at the world remotely. Um, if you haven't already done so, put your phone on the vibrator silent or whatever it is. Uh, quick reminder, the board's role is to set goals, listen to reports from the superintendent and staff members, approve the district's budgets, set our tax rates, approve contracts, approve personnel recommendations from the superintendent, and make policies for the district. The board's not here to make management decisions, management responsibility of the superintendent and his staff. Um, we have started as a couple of months ago something before each of our meetings as a reminder to help us center and focus uh, the district mission statement. Midway ISD will maximize individual potential within a learner-centered and supportive environment to prepare students to excel in global society. And following on that, to help us all center for this evening's meeting, um, a moment of silence. So I'd ask everybody to pause with me now, take a moment for prayer, meditation, reflection, or meditation. I know. <laughs> I know. By the end of the year, they're. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you guys for letting us come today from Chapel Park. Uh, dear President Russick, uh, Midway ISD Board of Trustees, uh, Dr. Allen, esteemed parents and guests and community members, as the proud principal of Chapel Park Elementary School, I'm thrilled to introduce our Student of the Year finalists this year. Uh, two are not here, so we are missing Hannah Rodkey and Chase Atkinson, but we also have Camry Eaton. She's fifth grader at Chapel Park. <laughs> Henry Schrant. <laughs> and our um, esteemed uh, Student of the Year finalist or winner is Cal Turner. These exceptional students make us proud every single day, and today we are going to bless you guys with saying the Pledge of Allegiance. If you guys will turn around and face the crowd out this way, and we're going to put our hand over our heart, and I'm going to be let you begin. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. And we also wanted to give you a gift because we have a big a day coming up on April 8th. So it is our total eclipse that we will be giving. I know that, uh, I think it was Miss Watts last time said, are we gonna get glasses? So you are getting glasses. You're also gonna get the QR code that every kid in the district's gonna get, as well as a moon pie, because why not have a moon pie on the eclipse? <laughs> As we, and then the last thing is also inviting you to our stream night. And that's going to be on Thursday night where we will have the planetarium from the district set up. So you can come in. We will have some people from the Maypor Mayborn that's going to do um, some eclipse training as well as making ice cream and all kinds of things. So you're welcome to come. It's from 530 to 730 this Thursday. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Ice cream, I'm totally in. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. guys. A brief moment of privilege here. I had the honor of being at Chapel Park during board recognition of January, and the five students that Kim has mentioned, uh, they allowed me to sit in and participate in interviews. And all five of <coughs> them, including the three folks here this evening, yeah, very, very impressive. Very mm -hmm. impressive. Good to see y'all. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You guys. Next up on our agenda is recognition. Uh, Dr. 
Launch Awareness Day. Yes, sir. We're going to officially recognize a few things. And so uh, March is Texas History Month. So if you didn't know that, we're honoring the history of the state of Texas. Music in Our Schools Month occurs in March. National Youth Art Month. This would be a good time for me to remind you that on March the 28th, in the high school theater lobby, we will be having our uh, Midway High School Art Show. Mm. So that's this month, and it coincides with National Youth, or National Youth Art Month. Well, that's too many syllables for me at one time. <laughs> theater in Our Schools Month and Women's History Month. And then March 1st specifically is Texas Girls in STEM Day. March 1st was Maintenance Workers Appreciation Day. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that in just a few minutes from Mr. Wolf. Great. Read Across America Day on March 2nd. And I hope that all the proud Texans know that March 2nd was also Texas Independence Day. I'm sure we covered that in grades 4 and 7 thoroughly. Um, March 3 through 9 is National School Social Work Week. March 4 through 8 is Celebrate Texas Public Schools Week. And then March 4th through 8th is also National School Breakfast Week. So start your day with a good breakfast and then come to public school. So those are the recognitions for March, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this evening, leading off our rest of our recognition, uh, helping will be Ms. Watts. And first up, we have State Special Olympics Power Lisa Well, good evening. Tonight, we get to recognize the achievements of eight powerlifting athletes from Midway High School and Empower who completed in the 2024 Texas Special Olympics Winter Games last month. They competed in squat, bench press, and deadlift events to bring home a grand total of 12 gold medals from the state meet. Athletes to recognize are Philip Alchard, Copus, Zachary Freeze, Angelo Garcia, Ella Hedrick, Devante Portis, Daquan Portis, Maddie Potts. And I'd also like to recognize our coaches, Jordan Ball, Laura Cloud, Veronica Pfeiffer, Julie Potts, and one of our partners, Riley Tilsley. These athletes trained hard for many weeks to learn proper lifting techniques and increase their strength and stamina. Additionally, at the opening ceremonies of the Winter Games, Midway's own Philip Orchard was invited to light the Special Olympics torch as a representative of Area 12. A special thank you to our family, school administration, and the board for their continued support of our program. Let's give another round of applause to these incredible athletes. Mr. Russick, if memory serves me correctly, it might have been that this time last year, this was the first meeting at which I stood behind this mic and did a recognition for the same award. So uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But each year, the Texas School Public Relations Association honors outstanding contributions to education communications through the statewide STAR Awards. In this year's awards, every single submission from Midway ISD Communications earned a gold rating indicating the highest quality for published work. Communication Systems Coordinator Robert Pryor, Multimedia Specialist Katie Durham, and former Director Tracy Marlin were recognized for one of the top marketing campaigns in the state. 
They received both a Best of Category and Gold Star Award for their work on the Superintendent Launch Campaign, which included a focus on transparent communication and community engagement. They had to do all of this while working with what is a very troublesome and difficult superintendent. <laughs> they also won a Gold Star Award for the district's first staff family night event. And we were doing the same thing a year ago, and it was on the redesign of our logo. And so every time we go to Teespra, all the other communications departments just put their heads down in sadness because they know we're walking out with all the hardware. So <laughs> congratulations, y'all. Well done. I'm standing right here, sir. Yes, sir. This is really exciting. Um, several months ago, I presented to the board about a work that we were trying to do as a district to bring an opportunity to our students that would allow them to engage in activities where they would partner with community-based mentors, industry partners, uh, post-secondary education providers, and our own staff to essentially to what to build an airplane in two years but that's not really the outcome we're looking for what we're looking for is the development of grit soft skills the ability to communicate read complicated blueprints work through technical skills um, and then uh, learn what it is to be part of a team that's trying to accomplish something that if it doesn't go well the consequences are dire there's nothing more authentic in terms of assessment than flying in a plane that you yourself have built so we're real excited because I told you at that meeting that if, if we could secure funding, we'd be able to uh, get this program off the ground. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I would like to ask to the front uh, Jordan Berry, who's representing the Midway Education Foundation, and Jess Wheeler, who spent countless hours of time working with all the partnerships necessary to pull together our excitement about the ability to launch Tango Flight in August of 2024 at Midway High School. So the Midway Education, Midway Education Foundation played a central role in the implementation of this program, serving as the facilitator for contributions that have made Tango Flight a reality. All donations in support of this initiative have passed through the foundation, which in addition to steward these contributions, provided their own significant contribution. The Midway Education Foundation provided $89,962 to start this program. We also received $44,000 from community partners, including Black Hawk Aerospace, Baylor University Institute for Air Science, the TSTC Foundation, Haggard and Stocking, and Colonel Joe McKethan. And then in addition to that, we received another $25,000 from a donor who's asked to remain um, kind of in the shadows a little bit. So we're really excited about the fact that we're able to do this for the students. But what I really hope that our students understand from this is that our community believes in them and our community supports them. And when you're able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to launch a program to do something new at the high school, that's the kind of thing that uh, I hope our students uh, value and treasure as a tangible expression of how much the people in this community believe in them and want them to succeed. And so thank you very much for this contribution and thank you to your hard work in making this happen. Departments sort of and, and sort of modeling them to fit us. Is that right? Because there was a lot there. I'm assuming we didn't write all that ourselves. We did not. And in fact, um, and Officer Fuller, you can stand to that mic in case what I say doesn't go far enough. They are essentially regular uh, admin regs that T Cole hands to us. Got gotcha. you. And then we put some of our information in to make sure it's midway applicable. But but they come down from T Cole. And so we've looked at some other districts, but it's it's pretty standard in terms of their expectation before they will grant us our application to form our own police department. Anything you'd add to that? On top of, <coughs> pardon me, on top of being kind of regulated by T. Cole, it's also, we, we pick these, these policies uh, from the Texas uh, Chiefs Police Association through their best practices. So these are going to be 
the uh, policies that most of the police departments that are seeking accreditation through the Texas Chiefs of Police Association are following. This is what, uh, once we're developed, once we have this going, I plan on seeking that accreditation for our police department, which essentially makes you the elite of the elite. And these are the policies that we're going to have to follow to get there. And so I figured we'd go ahead and start off on that foot. Very good. And, and you didn't ask this, but this is the first of what will be a number of MOUs. The Sheriff's Office had theirs ready, so we're bringing it to you. We'll need them with the rest of our law enforcement friends in the area as part. Of, so you'll see, you'll see more of these in the future is my point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right, if no other questions on the information items, we'll move on to the presentation discussions. The first of which is a update on our special populations. Lisa. Good evening. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm adjusting the mic so it'll be at my level. Fun <laughs> I want to update you on the numbers that are in our program at this time. Special education in the fall of 2023, our October snapshot, had us at 1,292 students. Um, last count was 1,348 students. Our growth is steady. Section 504, we have 1,089 students. Dyslexia, Section 504 students. 250. That gives us a total of 2,687 students in our program. And so that's about 30% of the student body. And so I just kind of want you guys to know how many students we serve within our department. I wanted to give you an overview of our programs in special populations so that you kind of know that we start with infants. We work with ECI, Early Childhood Intervention Services, and we provide deaf and hard of hearing services and vision services to these children. We currently have eight students in this age range that we're working with and that we'll be assessing to see if they will move into our three-year pro year old program, which is early childhood special education. And that program is three to five. Students enroll in Midway at that time. Those programs are housed at South Bosque, Hewitt Elementary, Park Hill Elementary, and Chapel Park Elementary. And we have 35 students that benefit from this program. Early childhood special education allows us to provide specialized supports and services. The goal is that we provide intervention early so that we can do the most and, and help the most at the mm -hmm. earliest age possible. We have several self-contained programs within the district, functional academics, academic development, intensive behavior intervention support. These classrooms provide specialized instruction and they're geared towards modified content, um, a smaller staff to student ratio, and these programs serve students with diverse and specialized needs. We are looking at children who may have feed-in tubes, who may need occupational therapy, physical therapy, counseling, all sorts of range of services. General education, resource, dyslexia, in-class support, and co-teach. These programs serve the bulk of our students and allow for specialized services geared towards reading, mathematics, and writing. We collaborate quite a lot with general education curriculum staff and teachers, providing robust educational experiences for our students with disabilities. Private homeschool. At this time, we've completed over 20 private homeschool evaluations. We work with um, private schools in our area and the Waco community. We provide speech and language therapy to special education students who attend First Woodway Christian and Primrose. They bring their children in for speech therapy services. We serve approximately 30 to 35 students for walk-in speech therapy. Why do we do this? Because one, we have a child fine obligation, and two, if we can intervene early when they come into our schools, then they are more prepared for, for school. And so that is why we do those things. Language is huge for our littles. Related services are areas 
This is the special in specialized services. Mm -hmm. I cannot talk enough about these individuals from OTs, PTs, behavior specialists, speech therapists, school psychologists. All of these individuals contribute so much to our program. They are what makes this program great, and they do an excellent job. Transition is a driving force in special populations. We want our children to be prepared for post-graduation. We want them to have employability skills. And our transition specialist, Kim Johnson, works very hard to do those things. She hosted an elementary parent transition night. We try to start early. We try to provide information to parents so that they're aware of what is coming so that there aren't surprises down the road. River Valley Middle School runs a snack cart two times per week. Um, we have a CTE teacher that teaches general employability skills, student to industry, a class on career prep. We're excited that we were awarded a grant from Texas A&M in the amount of $10,000 to um, for work-based learning. So we are really trying to push our transition services. And our Empower program continues to support our 18 plus population. The Midway Special Olympics team, and you saw several of our members just a few minutes ago. We are just proud. We're just proud of these children, their heart, the heart of the coaches and families that support these children. We have 50 children involved with Special Olympics this school year. Some of the fun things we did this year we had a parent open house this year so that families could come and meet all of the special education providers and professionals. We had a parent night in December for families of students with disabilities. We were interviewed for the Waco in on empower and empowering students. You know, we've had some really good opportunities to work with Baylor and their interns, PsyD students, practicum students, building those community relationships. Some challenges this year, House Bill 3928. Dyslexia is now special education. So next year when I come up here, I will say special education and section 504 because dyslexia is being absorbed into special education. It will require a full and individualized educational evaluation. It will require an IEP meeting. It will require goals. And it will require the board to adopt policy once the new handbook is completed and published by the commissioner. Um, it's been a heavy lift for our evaluators, um, for our 504 facilitators, and for our teachers. But we are working through it, and we are we believe we will get it all completed. So we feel like we're on the right path for that process. How are we doing? It's a pretty big program. We got a lot of things going on, but I'm proud to say we're doing very well. Um, when we turn in our data to the state, they look at how long it takes us to complete assessments. Are we doing it in a timely manner? Are we meeting transition needs in a timely manner? And I'm proud to say that Midway ISD met 100% compliance on all areas. And that is amazing. We did 214 initial evaluations last school year. It, the staff that does assessment is working incredibly hard. The results driven accountability system. This is another report card for me, so to speak. It looks at timely submission of data. It looks at compliance statuses. It looks at um, are we non-compliant, and if we are, did we correct it? And it looks at our financial audits. The ideal performance level zero is the score that we want. It's zero to four. Midway, we got all zeros. We met requirements. We did exactly what we were supposed to do. Now, next year, I don't know if it'll look like this, but for right now, I'm running with it. Um, we're excited, we're proud. Again, the team that works in this department works incredibly hard. Things that we're still challenged with, teacher retention, hiring, contracting, specialized services require specialized staff, and we wanna make sure that we're keeping our people here and we're keeping them happy. Um, growing pains, facilities, and equipment, um, making sure that we're staying on top of those things. To wrap it up, we are proud to work for Midway ISD and serve our children, parents, and staff. 
We want to ensure that all students have opportunity and access. The job is challenging, but it is very fulfilling. And I'm grateful to our team. And I'm grateful to Dr. Odajima, Dr. Allen, and the Midway ISD Board of Trustees for the support that we receive. We could not do this without you. Thank you. Any questions? One quick question. I, I love all the things that, that all your kiddos are doing and getting to celebrate them tonight and, and throughout the year. Um, can you talk just a little bit about how our Gen Pop students have an opportunity to come alongside, serve, and interact with these kids and support them? So one of the students that you saw tonight, Riley Tilsley, she's a partner. Yeah. And she partners with some of our students with disabilities. And so Gen Ed, we have partners PE um, that, they're, that they do come into the PE classroom and they are working. And then she also participates with Special Olympics and they partner with them as well. And so we try to make those opportunities available. I honestly believe as well that having students with disabilities in general education classrooms teaches tolerance and teaches our children that it's okay if we learn differently, mm -hmm. as long as we're all learning. Well, and Ms. Cochran, remind me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up the name on this a little bit, but Saturday we've got the Challenger thing, it, <laughs> game, the base, Challenger the base, game. I know we're challenging it, is, it but yes. our, our Gen Ed and students, we work together at the baseball softball game coming up this weekend. And so, that, go ahead. Well, that is not necessarily a Midway program, but yes, we host that here yes, at Midway for and our, our Midway students. ball players. Help they them. all partner up. Yes, right. yes our That's baseball team. Example, like even this week that we'll be doing something along those same lines. If you want to see baseball played like you've never seen, <laughs> it is a good game. It is really ins yeah. inspirational. Hey, so I have a quick question about, I, I'm really glad to see everything that's going on and seeing the kids that are here. And I think um, there's there's a lot in there about the great things that our kids are doing. I'm, I'm really just wanting to make sure because I know it's a really challenging place to retain and to recruit good staff yes. as well. So what, um, you know, what are the, I mean, what are the things that we're doing well or areas where we have identified maybe there's more training or maybe there's more things that we need to do. I, and I know there's some specialized skills. There's, there's, you know, speech path and there's psychology and things, but I even think about like behavior management and things like that. Are we are we where we think we need to be, or is there, are there more things we need to look at to make sure that our staff is, is happy and, and wants to stick around? Because they're doing good work. They are doing good work, and I do think uh, the bulk of our staff is happy. I do think we'll always need training as we rotate, as we have new staff come in, and as we lose staff, we're constantly going to need training. We've worked collaboratively with Sarah Collins to do video training. You know, we're, we're talking about those sorts of things because it's not that we just hire in August. We hire year-round. Mm -hmm. And how do we provide that training to folks um, when they're coming in at different times in the year? And looking at different ways to make sure that's available to them and we also work with our HR department to look at needs what do we have what do we need what are our workloads what are our case loads things along that vein so we are definitely trying to address that as well and trying to make sure that we are not pushing people to the per point of burnout well and I, I'm not trying to pick on special populations at all here I know we training is important for everything we do but when I, when I saw the numbers and the growth, it, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that started triggering in me is, hey, are we are we staffing to the level we need to be? Like, is is, it, is growth going to outstrip where we are? So I guess so, I don't know that there's a good answer to that, or there are well, benchmarks like for for that. I'm gonna, or, <laughs> I'm gonna hop in. It's a pretty open-ended question, I know. Well, so. I'll tell you, are we, are we staffed where we need to be? So what what, what I will highlight is that there that special education is one of the areas in which we have our biggest challenges with certifications. And Ash, you chop, hop in here anywhere you want, okay? But so for a number of our students who speak, teach in our special education programs, they're required to be certified in special education as well as whatever content they're teaching. Sure, yeah. And so it's a really, that, that creates a challenge. And then for some of our special education staff, additional certifications on top of that even. Yeah. And a DOI does not allow you like you cannot DOI people for special education certification. Okay. So there's very little flexibility and wiggle room. So it's an area where we have some of our biggest challenges in getting folks all the certifications they need. And in addition to that, an area in which we have some of the least amount of flexibility. 
-hmm. So are we, are we appropriately staffed? Uh, we are, but then, yeah. I mean, it's, I'm not, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat that for you. Um, as these numbers continue to increase, this will be one of the greatest areas of focus for us as we evaluate personnel needs. It's because it's, it's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, we increased stipends for many of these positions last year, and we've got a little high-level data back. We may be coming to the board looking to do that again as we uh, continue to try and retain the ones we have and fight to get others because this is not unique to Midway. We, uh, especially with the addition of dyslexia now and the additional burden that is, it, it is probably, special education in general, is probably one of the biggest challenges in the state. And so we're all, we're all kind of fighting for the same set of resources. Right. And so I feel good about where we are because we are competing really well for talent. It is a significant concern, our ability to continue to keep good talent, find talent, and then train that talent to be able to do all the things that we need to do. And what's becoming an increasingly complex uh, pro series of programs that we offer within the district. Yeah. And don't misunderstand, that wasn't a criticism at all. Oh, I understand. I, I was completely confident that we were where we needed to be. Yeah. I just wanted to have a chance to have a little conversation. So thank you. And I just, I'm trying to give you a pretty blunt answer. You're good. No, we're I, okay, but I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, it's tough. It's tough. Along those, along those lines, it always, it's always good in these presentations, the context of benchmarking. I mean, how do we compare versus yeah. other mm -hmm. districts, peer districts, districts in our mm -hmm. community, you know, in, in the county, and in, in, in state, statewide numbers when, that we compare? In, in regards to... The, the number of students we're serving as a percentage of our so student population. So all districts have, have increased their enrollment in special education. We are not different in that regard at all. And with the influx of dyslexia moving into special education, we will, continue, we will balloon comparable to every other district in the state of Texas because Texas is the only state who did not have dyslexia under their special education umbrella. And when the feds came in, that was the one, they would not leave until we finally put special education, or dyslexia under the special education umbrella. So we are definitely consistent with other school districts. Um, Texas, the last- The growth is consistent, the, but percentage-wise, are we at oh no, we're, the we're, average? Or we are at 13%. Are we, yeah. I think nationally it's 17%. So, when the last legal conference I went to, they still want Texas to grow, to hit, the, to get closer to that national average. Huh. So districts, I mean, we we as we used to have an eight percent cap, and so now we're working towards moving in that direction. But it is, it is slow. I mean, we're at 13, 14 percent. That's kind of where we hover. But Waco, all the other districts around us are are comparable. And just for purposes of clarity. The, the 13, 14 percent is special education only. That other percent, that 30 percent number, includes the 504. Five sure. Four, okay. So that's sure. yeah. right. Um, we're throwing numbers around. I just want to make sure yeah. we, we're all on the same page. Thank you. Yeah. When you come forward and say our, our uh, challenges are um, keeping our staff happy and facilities and equipment, my thought is, what do you need? How do we get it to you? <laughs> so, you know, we really do talk a lot with the different departments. Um, we talk with Baylor University. We had a, a change in table donated this week. I mean, we are getting equipment, we are getting things, but we are definitely looking at budgets and trying to make sure that we're covering all the needs. But if I go to Dr. Otajima, if I go to Dr. Knutson, they are usually pretty open and we try to problem solve and figure things out. So the support is there. There's not a child in Midway ISD who doesn't have a tool, a, a material item, whatever they need to implement their IEP. Now, what I will say is that we are always, we want to keep looking. We want to keep making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students and our families. Well, make sure we know specifically what that help look, needs to look like. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Other questions? Thank you, Lisa. Wesley, we missed you last month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, likewise. Sorry to, to not be here. Um, but you're going to catch us up this month. Catch right? you up a little bit. Yes, sir. Um, so looking at our uh, finance report for the month in February, um, so for, uh, we spent 52% of our budget um, at the end of February, and last year we're at 53, so 
uh, feeling pretty good there. On um, page eight of, uh, of the report, we'll look at our district enrollment. Our enrollment as of March 1st was 8,756. Um, at Snapshot, it was 8,849. So we've lost about 93 students since Snapshot. Uh, we typically lose some students, mostly at the high school. Graduate, gra uh, we have graduates that graduate early. Uh, this year, we actually have a little bit more uh, drop up at the high school. And interestingly enough, I looked um, that previous slide there in the elementary school enrollment. The last several years, uh, we've had an increase in the spring semester of our elementary uh, student enrollment. Just a slight increase, and it's kind of offset uh, that decrease in um, high school. This year, we actually have a have a decrease in our um, elementary enrollment. Um, you know, not not a ton. We actually have five less five less elementary students um, at the first of March uh, this year than last year. Um, so overall. Um, we're about 70 students um, uh, ahead of what we were at this point last year. So last fall I was saying, oh, maybe, you know, one, one and a quarter percent increase from the prior year. Now it's more like 0.7, 0.8%. Um, and, you know, you look at it as an average throughout the year. Um, but that's just kind of uh, where we are for enrollment at this point. That next slide, um, you can see our ADA for the four six weeks was 8,123. Um, and that was lower than the previous three. That um, last uh, uh, chart there at the bottom, our attendance percentage, um, you can see in the fourth six six was 94.8%. So that was pretty low. It's the flu season and all those things. Um, and so our average attendance percentage for the year is 95.9%, which is not terrible. It's actually you know, pretty good. Um, and just so FYI, for instance, 1% of attendance uh, percentage change either direction is about six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars um, to the district, so it's pretty impactful. I also mentioned that as well because our current school finance system is such that there's no mechanism for new funding. If our ADA WADA Tier One entitlement, you know, is the same year after year, there's no mechanism for uh, cost of living increases and raises. Um, and so, tennis percentage is one that we can look at, do some initiatives, and kind of encourage, um, you know, that. Uh, that to get higher. We can't do much about flu season and things like that. Um, just happened, but um, it's something to keep an eye on um, as we move forward. Um, any questions on attendance or enrollment? Um, the next slide are property taxes. Um, so as a percentage of our adjusted levy, we're um, in great shape. We've collected almost 98% of our adjusted levy, which is uh, typical for the end of February. We usually have collected most of our, uh, our levy at that point. Um, the percentage um, of budget you can see is lower than previous years, 88%. Um, and that's because when we got our certified values in July, um, the frozen uh, portion, the frozen levy of taxpayers, you know, over 65, so typically you turn 65, you get your uh, levy frozen, and over time, right, you know, your values go up, but you still get to pay down here. Well, this year with the increased homestead ex exemption, a lot of those over 65, their levy actually went down. But when we got our certified values, those were, that was not included. Um, so then when that got instituted, um, our overall levy uh, for the year is actually a lot lower than what we had budgeted. Uh, so that's why the percentage of our of our budget is a lot lower. Um, but if you look at the last page, our general fund projection for the year, um, that decrease in property taxes, you see that first line, uh, we're, we're projecting about four, four and a half million less in property taxes than what we budgeted, is largely offset by that, uh, the state revenue, the per capita and foundation, um, because the, the state, you know, offsets that. Um, we do have a little bit less total um, in uh, local and state revenue uh, because, as I mentioned previously, um, the uh, accrual in August. So some of our August days, that portion of our state revenue we had to accrue uh, for last prior last fiscal year. Um, then with our change in fiscal year for this year, we're not going to have an August to kind of offset that. So um, over our overall state and local revenue um, is close to what we budgeted. Total revenue um, is about a million dollars less than what we budgeted. But the good news is on the expenditure side, um, you can see there we're projecting um, about $4 million less. And so uh, and that's a big change for what was presented. I didn't want to present that last month when I wasn't here because I didn't want everybody <laughs> to get I wanted to see your smiles. So. Um, but no, that's a change because there is um, a one-time reversal of our salary accrual in August. 
um, those August days, uh, it's, it's about $4 million. And so uh, year after year, uh, we have that accrual. If there's more days than August, it increases less days. You know, it kind of goes back and forth by a couple hundred thousand. Uh, but this year with our change in fiscal year, we get to reverse that entire $4 million. So it's kind of a one-time, you know, one-time hit. We, we budget 100% of salaries every year. Um, but that accrual, uh, uh, we get to reverse this year. And Cindy Pointer and I, you know, we're looking at it. And we're like, are you sure about this? You know, we talked to our, our auditors and, you know, uh, made sure that, that is correct. So, so with that um, kind of one-time bump, um, we're going to actually get to probably put some, some funds into our fund balance uh, for this year. As you can see, 630000 right now. And, you know, as is typically as the months go on, hopefully you'll get a little closer to a million. Um, that's kind of what we're hoping um, to finish the year at. And that also so kind of plays into um, next budget year. So look at numbers for next budget year. Like I said, our enrollment, you know, I'll budget a little increase for next year, you know, and kind of cross our fingers. It's looking a little flat. Um, but our goal is to really get as close to a, a 2%, you know, compensation increase as possible uh, for next year. So um, to do that, um, we, have, we do have like about a million dollar that we take out of the um, general fund and put into the internal service fund for iPads every year. Um, so our plan is this year, uh, maybe go ahead and take that million dollars, uh, put it in the ISF fund, um, uh, just to kind of help uh, next year's budget look a little better. We realize it is a one-time thing, but that at least gets us through the second, half, second year of our biennium. Um, it kind of floats us another year. Um, it seems like we just finished the legislative session, but that gets us to the next one. Um, and hopefully, you know, at that point, you know, with all the, you know, we know the political situation going on with, with vouchers and the basic allotment, um, you know, kind of um, just gets us a little bit closer, you know, to something happening, maybe with the legislature. So our goal is to, um, to be able to have not more than maybe one, a little over uh, $1 million deficit adopted budget for next year using that, taking that million dollars that we would put in next year's budget and, and uh, put it in the ISF for this year. Um, so any questions? Heck of a bank sale, dude. Hey, the, the levy changes that you talked about, is that going to affect the yield of our golden pennies? I mean, or is that already sort of factored in when we, we knew that the homestead exemption change was going to happen? Um, yeah, no, that doesn't affect our, our tier two. We still okay. get the same guaranteed okay. yield per WADA. Um, so that, that's probably actually, I mean, it, our total guaranteed yield is the same, but it's more state funding. Okay. Because yeah. our, um, our um, money was down. Right. Okay. Speaking of golden pennies, though, even... Um, I, I'm going to state this as if it's true, and you have to help fact check me, okay? But even if the ledge doesn't take any specific action in the next legislative session, because of the guaranteed yield on golden pennies being tied to most recently Plano ISD's value, so right now we're getting $126 in change, gold, uh, guaranteed yield on golden pennies. That is likely to go up, which will be a little bit of a bump for us. And it doesn't require legislative action because it's tied to previous That's right. law, right? So one of the good things about getting another getting another year under our right belt of the system is that they can't mess that up. Like we're gonna <laughs> probably, we'll get that. It doesn't depend on them. Oh, challenge accepted. On them, take, on them taking action. So that's right. And then next month, of course, I'll have a lot more details on um, on next year's budget um, as everything's kind of moved up two months. Um, uh, campuses and departments are working on their budget um, submissions right now, and they'll be due um, here at the end of March. Not to put you on the spot, but have you heard anything? I know the special sessions were just over, but uh, for the basic allotment, is there any rumblings as to whether or not that might increase the next biennium? I don't know. I mean, the last the last bill, you know, I mean, I think most of the legislature wants an increase in the basic allotment. It just you know, was held hostage with the, the vouchers. So, yeah. um, so I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say. Depends on who the speaker is. Yeah. True. We, we, I mean, you asked him, but well, we've got through the midterms. We still have some runoffs ahead of us mm -hmm. and then the general elections mm -hmm. and then a speaker and that'll largely give us some idea about what to expect will blow in from Austin in the next session. Other questions for us? I agree with you. Thank you, Wesley. 
Operations update, Mr. Wolf. Good evening, President Rusk, uh, board members. I'm coming to you tonight to kind of give you an update on the operations department, kind of where we are, reintroduce us a little bit. There's been a lot of change uh, in the past year in that department, just kind of fill you in on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and who we are. Um, so moving on, so Joanne Sharp is our operations secretary. She's been there for a while. Some of you might know her. Uh, Phenomenal lady, keeps us all on task and keeps all the bills paid. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Bennett, Jimmy Bennett's been with the district for a few years, but he's in a new role. Uh, he is our maintenance and grounds coordinator. Uh, he uh, oversees a department of about 24 folks, 12 maintenance guys and uh, 12 groundskeepers. Uh, Kevin Summers is by far our longest tenured employee down there. Uh, he has over 20 years in the district, uh, all in custodial and about the last 13 as a custodial services coordinator. Uh, he oversees a, an office staff, his secretary, and then is in charge of the 11 head custodians we have and the over 70 plus uh, regular custodians that we have. And then with me tonight is our newest addition, Josh Albro. Uh, he is our assistant director of transportation and operations. Uh, he's been a phenomenal hire. He comes to us from Burnett ISD and uh, brings with him a wealth of knowledge that has greatly impacted uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the transportation department. Uh, there cannot be enough good things said about him and. Uh, his influence has already reached out to the staff and, and uh, campus administrators alike. Uh, but he oversees a couple office staff workers, uh, some shop mechanics, and then he has 57 drivers and about 20 aides uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that he keeps up with. So talking about maintenance and grounds, so maintenance and grounds staff are responsible for upkeeping about 1.7 million square feet of space uh, and mow about 415 acres. Uh, so you got to remember that, that there's 12 guys that are taking care of 1.7 million square feet of space and work orders that are coming in. Uh, those translate to about 1,150 HVAC systems across the district, about 18,000 light fixtures, 2,200 plumbing fixtures, and 5,500 doors, -ish, you know, somewhere in those neighborhoods. So when you put those numbers in scope, all the principals back here are snickering. They're like, man, that's a lot of stuff that they keep up with. And most of it's on Allison's campus. So. <laughs> But they, they do do a lot, and they're spread thin, and, and, and I'll tell principals, you know, hey, guys, I know you're in a hurry, you want this done, but I got 12 other of you that are all screaming the same thing, so just, just give us some time, and we'll get to you. And they all understand. Um, so work orders, so since the start of August, when teachers pretty much come back and we get the year kicked off and running, uh, we're averaging about 400 work orders a month uh, for the maintenance staff. So that's 12 guys, and that's kind of a breakdown of, of what each department consists of. And uh, they're, they're knocking things out, and we're sitting at about 50 uh, open work orders right now out of the 3,000-plus that have been submitted since the start of school. Um, we are a little bit understaffed, so we do contract some things out. Uh, you'll see some, some higher numbers in our contracted services budget. Um, I'm looking to pull that number down and hopefully work with Ashley on bringing some uh, additional FTEs on board to help us uh, where we need the help. Uh, so things moving forward that maintenance and grounds we're going to be working on over the next year. Uh, evaluate our current work order system. Our current work order system to me is not quite as robust as what we like. Josh and I have talked about that. Um, exploring new options and becoming a little more mobile. Uh, Cross-training our staff on other trades. Uh, there's nothing that frustrates me more than when a staff member is on a campus and campus says, hey, I got a problem and they, that, that's somebody else's job. I'm here to fix this. Man, go at least take a look at it and see if there's something you can do. Um, some things in my wheelhouse that I'll be working on is performing an energy audit of district facilities to identify some cost saving options. I said, I did this at Waco, I did this at Temple. Uh, so I think there's some, some savings potentials there that we can certainly investigate, especially with uh, Wesley's difficulties on trying to find some monies for everybody. Um, facility as assessment plan updates, that hasn't been done uh, in at least 10 years, I think, from, from the information that I've found. Um, so we'll look at the possibility of, of contracting with some third-party consultants for input uh, on looking at our facilities, uh, especially with all the growth that we're having uh, to help us develop a long-range plan. Uh, the demographic, demographics report identified, you know, some areas of growth, so we need to be ready uh, to hit the ground running when those things kind of take off. Uh, so transportation services. So the transportation department is responsible for transporting an average of 2,600 kids a day which is about 30% of all district enrolled students. Um, this year we've uh, 
uh, implemented the smart tag system that's now been deployed out to all campuses and are using, utilizing that so we can track students, know when they were dropped off, if they're still on a bus. Uh, so that, that's been a useful tool for our department. Uh, the department also uh, schedules and handles about 100 trips per month district-wide, so that could be things like uh, field trips to the Mayburn Center or athletics going to College Station for a ball game, stuff like that. Uh, buses log approximately 3,300 miles a day just in routes. That's not counting trips. That's not counting everything else. That's just taking kids to school and taking them back home. Uh, so that, that's a lot of... You, you multiply that times 176 days, that's a lot of miles racked up. Uh, so when you see that large uh, PO come at the start of school for fuel, you know where it's all going. Um, so this is kind of a breakdown on transportation services, our student ridership, uh, where we are and who we serve. Elementary numbers are always gonna be a little lower because a lot of those campuses are walk to school campuses and you know they live within the, within the zone. Um, it picks up at the general, or at the uh, secondary level uh, and then Field trips and events, actually last month we ran 158 field trips and different events uh, across the district. Of course, the number one of that driver being athletics. And then our district ridership participation. Like I said, we run about 30% of uh, all enrolled students and then about 75% of everyone that is eligible is currently riding. A lot of folks will sign up for transportation just as a crutch in case they can't get there in time or something like that. So we don't transport every kid every day. So some things moving forward for transportation services next year, training, training, and more training. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to talk with Ashley and them about adding additional days to the start of school to prepare our staff for training. You know, we bring teachers in early to get them prepared for the year. We need to do that for some of our staff that have been laying out all summer long and get them back in familiar and, and uh, some, maybe some new regulations that have come down from TEA or something like that. Uh, also looking at more efficient routes. Uh, Josh has tasked his staff with uh, coming up with a, at least a 10% reduction in, in routes, which sounds like a lot, but that's two or three routes. You know, we have some routes that are real lean in students. You know, maybe we can combine them with some other ones, be a little bit more efficient. And then working on becoming a third-party testing site. Most large districts our size uh, do all their own uh, bus driver certification and testing in-house through DPS, become a, a DPS-approved third-party testing site. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not one in McLennan County. The closest ones are Temple and Belton. Uh, and those programs, uh, districts will send staff there to get trained, and, and most of those districts charge anywhere from $2,000 to $2,500. So that could be something that we could potentially, you know, hit up China Spring and Lorena and some of the other small districts, or even Waco, because Waco doesn't have one. Huh. Uh, bring them over here, make a little money, and uh, uh, help out our neighbor districts, maybe do a little recruiting while they're here and, and bring them on, <laughs> bring them on to us. Uh, <laughs> so uh, custodial services, uh, custodial services kind of like uh, uh, maintenance is also responsible for cleaning about 1.7 million square feet of space and they do a phenomenal job every day of getting that done. Um, can't say enough about those folks. You know, there's cafeterias every day that got to be cleaned, about 12 of them, you know, classrooms, we're over 600 classrooms, restrooms, office spaces. Uh, so there, there's a lot that those folks uh, undertake every day. And mo most folks may not know this, but custodians also do uh, 34 different crossing guard assignments across mm -hmm. the district. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that are out there in the rain in the morning, making sure that kids are getting across the road safely and getting back home in the evenings. Uh, so with that, if you have any questions, uh, well, I, I, sorry, I, I, one more. So custodial services moving forward, I forgot about this. Uh, means and methods for more effective and efficient cleaning. Um, I was at a, a conference not long ago uh, where the, the uh, GPS guided little Zambonis that do all the cleaning. You know, you've seen them at Sam's going down the aisles. You know, those things will, will clean floors for six to eight hours. Well, we have a guy that sits on it right now doing the same thing. He could be doing something else. So there's some things like that that we can look into to help us be a little bit more efficient, uh, stuff like that. And then campus report cards are something we did at previous districts. And uh, we don't know where we need to improve. Uh, unless you let us know. So that's not something I'm just going to do for custodial services. That's also something we're going to do for transportation and maintenance. Uh, send report cards out mm -hmm. to campuses to get some feedback from them. Our mm -hmm. work orders getting done in a timely manner. Our campuses getting clean, you know, the way you like it. Where are your problem areas so we can address those uh, kinds of things in the future. So now with that, I'll take any questions or if you have any. 
So on the transportation side, uh, give us a benchmark there. I mean, how do we compare to other districts? I mean, 30% kind of seems like a low number of, of so participation. It, it, I, so I can use my previous district as an example. That number is a little lower because we are the one mile uh, walk zone area. So if you live within one mile of the district, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we're a two mile zone. So if you live within two miles of the campus, uh, then you're not eligible unless you live in a danger zone. Some districts are at a one mile zone, so their ridership is going to be a lot more than ours. Um, but most districts like us, we're, we're pretty close, pretty comparable uh, to those unless they have a, a zone that's a lot tighter than ours. Mm -hmm. Do what, What's our capacity uh, with the vehicles and drivers we have uh, if, if we decided to go to a one mile? Or we, would, we would need a lot more drivers and a lot more vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I think we, we have 54 is what we're running now. Uh, Temple is a one mile zone. I think they run 80 something. So they're roughly the same size district we are. Mm -hmm. So you almost double it. To, to kind of give you an example, I think the only busing that we do at Hewitt is sped. Everyone at Hewitt is currently lives within the walk zone. So you would basically be transporting the majority of Hewitt students now that you're not doing. Other questions for Ken? Great job. Thank you. <laughs> good, good evening. Thank you guys for the opportunity to provide you a technology update tonight. Um, some of the things we're going to go over. You'll know all about our one-to-one -one device refresh plans. We're going to talk about uh, briefly work order distribution. I'll share some E-rate info with you that results in more funding for our district. I'll show you how we're leveraging technology to make our schools safer and wrap up with a summary of summer projects. I'll move quickly because I see my timer's going. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Watts told me to slow down and Dr. Odajima told me to speed up, so I'm not sure what, you, what you're doing. But I'll beat that timer and we'll have questions at the end. So we're in our fourth year of the seventh generation iPad that we bought in 2020. And our internal, internal service fund that we talked about using for other purposes is currently used to fund our four year refresh cycle for iPads. Uh, so last fall, we began planning for this upcoming refresh. So Apple's latest iPad is called the 10th gen <coughs> iPad. When it was initially released, it was done so at a price point that's out of line with what we budgeted. Uh, in fact, it was $90 higher than its predecessor. So, uh, of course, they've, re they've since revised their pricing, and it is in line with our budget. But at the time, last fall, we're looking at this, and we're like, guys, we've got to really look at our needs here uh, and potentially examine all uh, other platforms. So we met with various stakeholder groups, and we asked them, when considering a new device, what are the most important considerations? Kind of back to basics. So each of the groups came up with their list of considerations. Common themes began to emerge, allowing us to reconcile those lists into one master list of 12 metrics. Then we take those 12 metrics, put them back to the groups, and ask them to order those, um, to rank them in order of greatest to least importance to them. Here's an example of a ranked list from one of those stakeholder groups. The metric rankings were then averaged across all the groups to come up with this list of ranked metrics. I was glad to see security rose to the top and other important metrics ranked very highly. A little surprised to see cost uh, land about sixth, but then again, the folks on these committees weren't providing me budget codes for a refresh. Um, <laughs> so, so these are the, the lenses with which we analyzed the devices last fall. Some of the top contenders were the new iPad 10th gen, also two different models of Chromebooks. Um, next, we'll look at some of these metrics and how the devices stacked up. Starting with security, uh, we found that both Chrome OS and iPad OS are historically immune from viruses. They get frequent updates from the manufacturers. Uh, they both have the ability to be effectively managed with a central manage, uh, mobile device management system. However, Chrome OS did suffer from the shimmer vulnerability last year. If you're not familiar, this allowed students to unenroll their devices from the MDM uh, and then have unfiltered access to the internet while at home. Um, this vulnerability has since been resolved on Chromebooks, but um, iPads have never been subject to such a, a huge vulnerability. 
Another high ranking category was switching costs. That is, we know that if we were to switch from iPads to Chromebooks, we should consider the time and labor required to retrain staff and students, to recreate the necessary support systems, to locate suitable replacements for the existing apps, and to replace any classroom peripherals that are currently built for iPads. Also worth noting, uh, when moving to a 10th gen iPad, they changed their headphone jack to a standard USB-C. So we'll want to be mindful of that uh, and get that change communicated to classrooms that have headphones on their school supply lists. In regard to app parity across the platforms, there's often direct replacements for apps uh, that we currently use. For example, uh, our kids use Notability on the iPads. However, if on Chromebooks, they could uh, use Google Keep. Uh, however, there are many apps in use that there are no comparable Chrome replacements. Some of those are listed. All right, this is an important one. It compares the cost of the top three contenders. If you combine the base cost of the device with a warranty, a protective case, and the management license and bundle that together, you get that middle column called total bundle price. Uh, initially, uh, iPad is slightly more than the other two. But if you look at the next column labeled year for resale value, you can see that iPad makes up that ground and then some as it retains more of its value at the end of four years. So the four-year TCO of the iPad is between $90 and $100 less than the two Chromebook in comparison here. Some other metrics where the devices performed similarly. Uh, it's worth noting that the new iPad keyboard has a full trackpad and provides that same laptop experience that our teachers have expressed a desire for and, and what our students need to prepare for the workforce. So here is the master evaluation matrix. The winner in each category gets uh, the full points for the metric and the others get a value relative to how closely they trailed the winner. In our testing, we were unable to find a metric for which the iPad was uh, either not tied or the clear winner. So our recommendation for device refresh is to go with Apple's latest education device. That's that 10th gen iPad. It's going to provide the greatest economical value to the district, and it's going to allow us to leverage nearly a decade of professional development and curriculum investments. So far this school year, we've closed 3,272 work orders. It's about 5% more than we were this time last school year. Not too concerning. Uh, overall, the quantity of work across our instructional campuses tracks directly with student density. So that's exactly what we'd expect to see here. You remember E-Rate is a federal program that provides uh, funding to schools to help with the cost of internet and network connections. The amount of our discount corresponds to our percent of students on free and reduced lunches. New this year, our numbers went up slightly to 36% free and reduced lunch, which moves us from the 50 to 60% discount category. Nice. So an eligibly priced item uh, that cost $1 would cost the district 40 cents. Also new this year, bus Wi-Fi has been added as an allowable category one expenditure. Here's how we plan to leverage E-rate this year. In category one, as always, we'll use uh, internet and campus fibers. They'll be discounted. Uh, in addition, we applied for E-rate to outfit our 12 travel buses with Wi-Fi. Under category two, we're requesting core network switches to replace uh, 10, 12 year old equipment at Woodway, South Bosque and Spiegelville. Uh, once this is, this is approved federally, you'll see it again in April or May for a uh, consent agenda. Good news from our recent cybersecurity assessments. Our monthly perimeter scan has consistently been free from vulnerabilities, and the results of our internal assessment have continued to improve year over. Some of the factors we feel that contribute to the improvement include adding multi-factor authentication for all staff on their email. In fact, that's helped reduce the successful phishing attacks by 99%. There's only one, and it was actually a new person who hadn't gone through MFA yet. We've also geofenced all of our email accounts. What that means is uh, you can't log in if you're not in the U.S. or one of our allied countries. So let me know before you go on vacation if you need email out of, out of the U.S. We've also implemented change control in our data center. That means any service impacting change to our infrastructure is discussed, documented, and scheduled prior to implementation. Since my last board report, we added a great feature to our phone system. It's called CallAware for 911. 
What it'll do is anytime someone dials 911 on the campus, it will alert the SROs and administrators that that's happened. It will also send an alert to the front receptionist phone with a message on it that shows the extension that called it and the time that called it and the classroom number. So that's gonna make it very efficient for first responders who are reporting to help direct them to the right place. The same group for uh, lockdowns. Email continues to be the most heavily used vector for infecting school networks. Of the 20 million incoming messages so far this year, our system has detected and blocked 15 million of them as spammer virus. Over 214,000 of them were identified as phishing attempts. We encourage our users to think before you click on email hyperlinks. We are about 90% complete on adding door position sensors and card readers to every exterior door in the district. It's proved to be a pretty big project, a lot of cable to pull, a lot of work, working around class times. Almost there. These sensors are gonna allow us to uh, provide administrators alerts on door status events. So that's a door that failed to close all the way, uh, a door that was opened, um, forced open or unauthorized entry after hours. We've also integrated our access control system with our surveillance system, which allows us to combine the two systems in a single map. Imagine the efficiency of glancing at your campus map and when all the doors show green, you know they're all closed and all locked. Or if you see orange, you know the door is open, you can quickly switch over to that camera and see why it's open. I think it's a game changer. We wanted the best maps for this project. So our team has also updated all the campus security maps to include every exterior door number every interior room number and the latest blueprints that include the recent construction changes. Finally, a few projects we plan to complete this summer. As mentioned before, we'll be upgrading our core network switches at three of our elementary schools and hopefully pending board approval, refreshing our iPad fleet. We also plan to replace about 130 old teacher workstations at the high school campus with new PCs. It's part of our five-year refresh cycle for teacher computers. As part of this project, we're also upgrading the AV cabling in all of those classrooms. The current cabling is VGA and not compatible with modern PCs. We plan to do all this work in-house, so it's shaping up to be another busy summer. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks for your time and attention. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them now. You did a great job. <laughs> uh, so the, the refresh of uh, equipment that'll be for next fall, is that which which They're refresh? On the iPads. So this refresh will will we if we order them now tomorrow yeah. we'd have them in time for teachers before they leave for the summer, and certainly before students arrive in August. Okay, so we don't we don't have the uh, supply chain issues or anything in that. I've been told they could be here in three weeks. No? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of that extra time we're building in is to help provision them, asset tag them, case them, all that sort of thing, logistics. My other question on the on the uh, security, um, I guess that's a, a portal, something that online that uh, you're looking at that, those maps. Who's watching that? Because it's great having it, but mm -hmm. somebody's got to be watching it all the time too for it to be meaningful or use, used. Right. So that's our video management system that now has access control integrated into it. So anyone who would have had access to, it's called Video Insight before, has access to this now. So think uh, campus SROs, campus safety specialists, uh, principals, assistant principals. But people whose jobs aren't necessarily to watch it all the time. There's, nobody, there's nobody watching it all the time. There's not like a, I'm not sure to a what control extent, center where this is all getting. So as far as, no, we do not have a person that, that, that is their When I was at the high school, I kept it pulled up on my, on my TV so that I could monitor yeah. it. Not, again, I'm not sitting there staring at it all day long, but it is there being monitored as much as I can. What, what I'd envision with that, uh, Mr. Tellis, is at every campus having a large panel at, in the SRO's office that has this new map pulled up so you can quickly see the perimeter status of all the doors and click on cameras that you wanted to see. Yeah. And just my thought there is if if we have a system that's tracking that and we know what's going on, we carry some additional liability if, we don't, if we're not doing something with that information, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. it, it, so 
there's it's a redundancy. It's actually got levels of redundancy. One, the map tells us if it's open or closed. Right. Two, the prop door alarms tell us if it's open or closed, and we we can set how long a door can be open. And that and that alarms at the door, or is it on the system? Both, because it'll turn that door to red. Yeah. And then when I mean, it's not like the door doesn't make a squealing sound, but it'll send messages via text to whoever's on the text chain. Hey, the store's open in the building. Someone okay. needs to go look at it. Do, and then the third layer of redundancy is we still do our door audits, like our physically go push the door and make sure the thing's closed. So if the tech fails, we still do the old fashioned rattle the door and see if it's locked thing. So there's, there's three levels of checking the security on those doors. And I'm going to sound like Captain Obvious for a minute, but the other real huge advantage to those maps is if we are in a first responder event, the ability pulls up quickly in our first responders, even if we're not monitoring them every minute of the day, for them to look at that map quickly and just see where we open, where we closed, it's helpful when you're dealing with an event, whether you're talking about fire, weather, or a potential threat to the campus. Yeah, we think it's huge. And if you're set to get those alerts, you'll get them at home. You'll get them via your email and text. Yeah. Hey, so I have a technology-related question, um, but it, it may be more of a campus behavior kind of question. Where, where, where are we with sort of personal technology device use, classrooms, integration? I mean, I know there's, there, there's some places that may have a push towards, you know, bring your own device towards things, but I think we're clearly going the other direction. So what, where are we in terms of, hey, kids with cell phones out or not? It's not really a technology question, so that's why I'm not looking at you. <laughs> it is, but it's not. Yeah. Um, that is an issue that I think we need to tackle as a district. Yeah. And the answer is somewhat vague because I'm not real sure where I think it's going to land. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a sticky conversation. Our teachers will tell you it's probably the single greatest disruption to school is the cell phone, not the iPad. And yeah. I'll tell you, when I was high school principal, I, I liked kids being able to use these because we use them for instructional purposes. The thing is, we give the kids iPads now. Right. They don't really need these. Okay, so they can do all the things they need to do instructionally with their school issued device. Um, and so I think that we need to engage our community in a conversation probably as soon as this fall about what they want for their kids and what the barriers to that success is. We're also gonna have to negotiate that balance because we have a lot of parents who um, enjoy slash cling to the convenience of being able to text their children throughout the day. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to have to figure out what the comfort point is. Um, I mean, I can tell you my personal preference would be, but I'm, I'm not sure that that is exactly where we ought to land. So I think we have to find that spot where we're able to lean in on what the mission of the district is and how to accomplish that mission. Recognize the fact that more and more districts are moving in the direction of limiting access to these throughout the course of the day. And we have a rule right now that says they're not supposed to be out, be, they're not supposed to be out if they're not being used for school purposes. But I, I honestly would tell you, I think our teachers feel overwhelmed and that the district would need to lean in with a stronger stand on this. Okay. Um, and so I think that the topic you're right, like if you go up to my dry erase board in my superintendent's conference room right now, you would see written on it, cell phones and a question, in a question mark. So where it is, it's a topic that I intend for us to try and wrap our heads around as part of a process that involves a fair amount of feedback this fall. Well, Jesse had such a good report. I had to ask something related to technology. So yeah. <laughs> that, was the can, that was the can of worms I threw out on the table. It's Sorry. Bring that it up, is a can I of worms. Just bring that up to me just today and uh, research data about uh, collecting cell phones policy and SAT scores going up was really so Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah. Also funny you bring it up today, Colin, because what did I bring up Friday when we talked? Well, right after my meeting with Mr. Rusick, I wrote into my, I went into my conference room and wrote down cell phone <laughs> question marks. <laughs> on the board. I actually wrote it on my notepad and I wrote it on the, on the dry race board today because I was going back through my list of things we're working on. So he was going to put it in his cell phone, but I told him he couldn't use it. <laughs> he, <get> a cell <laughs> phone. he could put it in his iPad. Yeah. Sorry, Jesse, no, there's not your specific monkeys. I'll just um, say that, that the student use of their personal smartphone during the day Y'all just thought drawing attendance zone boundaries was tough. <laughs> yeah. How many other districts are enacting that policy? Do you know? I don't. I don't have a number off the top of my head. I will tell you, like I just because I'm pretty good friends with Superintendent Temple, 
they they took a big bite out of that this at least a year or two years ago now and they have their kids do the locking pouch things and and so they like i said just at one point districts were all kids need to use them we use them they help us as adults get organized and help kids well that was before snapchat and instagram and facebook and that's the stuff i know which means it's not the stuff the kids are actually using right <laughs> and so the world has changed dramatically in in the 12 years that have occurred since i was last working on a campus um, and and because more and more districts are one-to-one -one, they, there's just they don't really have a good purpose in having cell phones out during the day that serves an educational purpose and so i think we have to figure out how to put boundaries around the use of those that work within the greater expectation of our community i bet there's some good hard data out there that can be used to communicate with parents i'd, I'd, I'd ask the question when they when they're pulled up how the, far the instances of cyberbullying goes down yeah so. More and more data every day. More and more data. Am yeah. I right remembering that uh, the highest weeks of, of traffic on our network are during March Madness? <laughs> <laughs> Is it, have you told us check, that check, before? Check back with me Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> that in the lunar eclipse, yes. <laughs> Quick and easy question. Just to confirm, the device that, that you're recommending is the one that has the lowest base price? It is. No, it does not it's, have the lowest base price. It does not. Okay. So which one? Lowest. So the, the, the iPad 10th Gen uh, bundle price was slightly higher than the other two. But after figuring the, the resale value after four years, the total cost of ownership of that device was lower than the other two. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. But, but still. Look at the price per year. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah. That's still. Well, because I'm looking at these numbers. And if I were a consumer, I'm like, the, the differences in price are really fairly minor, but when you multiply it at times, how many kids right. get an iPad? 10,000 iPads. We're looking at about 10,000. Yeah, that's so, uh, I, I appreciate you looking at that piece of it so carefully. So Jesse, you just said resale after four years. I noticed in our agenda item on the consent agenda, it's a four year lease that right. we're talking about. Well, mm. what are we, what's the contemplation at the end of that? Do we exercise the $1 buyback and then sell them that way? Exactly. Or? They, they posed that as an option to us, um, 0%, and they gave us some more flexibility on what we want to do with our local funds over the next four years. Um, and at the end of it, um, technically, it's a $1 buyback. This would be the second time we did this, and I don't know if I should say this on record, but they did not charge us the $1 <laughs> for the buyback. Okay. I think it just makes a clean lease. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Good. Fantastic. Other questions, folks? Can we talk more about cell phones? We're, uh, <laughs> we're dangerously close to going off agenda. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Sorry about that can of worms there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 2223, emphasis on that. We're looking back through the rearview mirror, Dr. Odejima. District annual report. Thank you so much. As you noticed, we're traveling back in time to do our public hearing of the annual report for the 22-23 um, school year for our district. So in the um, district annual report, um, this is very similar to what you've seen last year. So the sections that we'll breeze through tonight, because you've already seen this information in previous board meetings, is um, our both uh, current status and also progress that we're making um, since that time for these areas. But we'll talk about um, TAPER, the PEAMS Financial Standard Report, the first report that Wesley does, um, our district accreditation status, the campus performance objectives, uh, our discipline report on, only on the violent and criminal incidents, um, our student performance in post-secondary institutions, and then our progress toward our House Bill 3 goals that are designated by our board. So uh, if anyone would like to follow along in the audience, this is the QR code. This is the site that Dr. Sapp has prepared for us that holds folders of all of the detailed information about each of these areas that you can um, go back to to remind yourself about the presentations that have happened over the last 12 to 18 months with this data. But um, it is all located there, and it's on our website, live and, and uh, available to any uh, member of our school district or the public. So why now? The uh, district is quite required to do a public meeting of our information and then also post that on our website. And so this serves as that report for our 22-23 school year. Um, 
Again, this is not new. It's a repeat of the things that you've heard in previous board meetings. So we'll move quickly here. The first one has to do with the taper report. This is um, the academic report of student performance. It disaggregates student groups and data. Um, it looks at teacher demographics in our district. And so what we know from our taper report that we presented um, earlier in the school year with our summary from the 23 um, testing cycle is that Midway continues to outperform the state and region on our star tested areas. We also outperform the state and region in our CCMR scores. Um, and outperform the state and region and other comparable districts with our TSI assessment scores. So that's the college readiness score or test that our students take when they're going to community colleges or TSTC. Um, so in progress, we're continuing to focus our efforts this year and throughout the year on moving more students into that master's level. You may remember that conversation from before. The entire state saw a dip in the master's level of performance, and so we are looking to improve that for our next year as well. So we continue to work through that. In um, section two, our information on the PEAMS financial report is available. So this is the first report that uh, Wesley presents each year um, that tracks our financial expenditures by function and the variance in um, the information that comes from that. And it, they always do an excellent job. Our total variance in all of those numbers that they assess is less than 3%, so that's excellent. So it is a superior rating. Um, for our district and um, Wesley and his department continue to implement and refine the processes um, to make us even better in those uh, financial reporting components. As far as district accreditation goes in section three, this is not like the accountability rating, but this is your ability to be accredited as a school system. So the state accredits each school district based on our student performance and accountability ratings, as well as the first rating that Wesley uses for our finance um, pieces, so it combines those things. Midway receives an A as superior achievement. We're an accredited um, group. So we continue to look at our student performance data to make sure we stay in a great place with that. And then Wesley continues to work um, in his department to make sure we're excellent in our business area as well. Um, as far as campus performance objectives go, you've seen these recently um, this year and every year in October of the year, you look at campus improvement plans. So campuses identify performance objectives for their campus that are aligned with our district improvement plan goals. Um, and those are um, presented to you at the October board meeting. So we um, are doing that same process this year. We've embedded even more of a component of looking at those on a regular monthly basis in our district leadership meetings to make sure that we are on track and we're, we're reaching the thresholds that we've set for ourselves um, for success in those areas that we've identified for each of our campuses. In section five is the report on violent or criminal incidents. These are only the more egregious or um, criminal type acts that may have happened on campuses. So in the 22-23 school year, we had one occurrence um, that uh, was an incident that uh, was a mandatory expulsion. So we had one student. Um, so we continue to collect data and look for ways to intervene so that things like that don't happen and that students know um, what responsibility is on our campuses. In the next report, this next section is the student performance in post-secondary institution. If a student leaves midway and goes to a state um, two or four year school, college or university, or an independent university, we can get the data on um, their attendance, but also on how they do. And so we had 367 kids from our graduating class in 2021. So this trails a year even further than the last year's report because it's CCMR related. But 367 of those students um, were enrolled in a Texas institution, and 302 of those were earning a 3.0 or higher, or 150 of those were earning a 3.0 or higher. So that's neat to be able to follow and see how they're doing. I'm proud to claim one of those students as my child. Mm. Thank Excellent. you very much. I am too. I'm not sure we met yes. the 3.0, but um, we were there. Um, so uh, we'll continue to um, look for ways to assist our graduates um, and then... Um, just know that some of our students are doing well and are in institutions of higher learning. They just aren't in the state of Texas. Um, the next section, section seven, is our progress toward meeting our board adopted House Bill 3 goals. And if you remember House Bill 3, we identified uh, um, math, early literacy, and then CCMR goals as a district. 
So what we can report from the 2022-2023 school year is that our math target was 73% um, achievement and our district performance was at 64% reaching those targets. Um, so we didn't quite meet the threshold we set, but our performance increased from a 59 to a 64, so certainly making positive growth. Um, in the area of early childhood literacy, our target was 69, our performance was 67, and that increased from a 65, so slow and steady. We're, we're making ground, or we did that year, um, and plan to do the same with those targets this year. We have higher targets, and we're trying to track progress on that even now. Um, for that school year, our CCMR target was 90%, and we performed at 96, so excellent overachievers in CCMR, so we're very proud of that. Um, so as far as like what we look at this year moving forward, we're looking at the areas where we didn't quite achieve um, the standard that we set. So looking at the only four of the campuses that um, didn't reach the, the threshold that we set for um, math and for uh, early childhood literacy. And then for CCMR, all we can do is look to the 3.6% of graduates that didn't meet that and look for ways that we can find a pathway for them to achieve that CCMR readiness. And with that, um, is there any public feedback or comment? Questions from the Questions. Board. If not, then we will formally call the public hearing that the board is required to have on our district annual report to order and uh, ask any member of the public wishing to uh, speak to the board about this annual report to uh, Please come forward. Hmm. Not hearing from any member of the public, we will close the public hearing and say thank you, Becky. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Well done. Yes. Uh, consideration items. Consent agenda. We've got minutes from our February 20 regular meeting. Our proposed new club at the high school, Cosmetology, accept certification on our board members being unopposed and cancel the election. Um, budget amendment, the early graduation request, the iPad refresh that Jesse just went over with us, and then a BPA out-of-state trip. Does any board member wish to remove any item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Motion by Mr. Alford. Second. Second by Ms. Watts. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Uh, discuss and take possible action regarding approval of a resolution in support of a fair and transparent accountability system. This agenda item was a board member request um, who wants to talk about it first? Well, I'm assuming we're not running through all the slides at this time, correct? Because y'all have all had a chance to look at them. Yes. Okay. I did. I did um, have just a, a few remarks about it, if I may. Absolutely. Um, the, the what was in our packet was given as a presentation by uh, Kingsville ISD Superintendent Dr. Sissy King, uh, Sissy Perez. Uh, when I was with our leadership TASB class in Corpus Christi. And if, as you've read it, what you'll see it does is talk, talk about the consequences to our school districts if, as we just saw in our accountability measures, um, the numbers that you have to hit to make certain grades are changed. And so Commissioner Morath decided to refresh some of these measures and it was going to hurt the performance of the school district and because but but the issue that they had and the reason why they pursued a lawsuit was because he was planning to make those measures retroactive so like giving the grade after all you know deciding what you need to make a good grade after all of the homework has been assigned and turned in and completed or as I like to say it's like moving the goalpost after the football's been kicked in the air um, and so they she goes into a lot of detail about what that looked like what the numbers were going to be how that would impact the school um, 
and a few of the things that were shared with me during that presentation. First of all, uh, for a superintendent to file suit against the education commissioner is not really considered a strategic career move. Um, but she said, we, we looked around and said, what have we got to lose? I believe going into this, uh, that year they were at an F rating, if, if memory serves, um, but they just determined we don't have anything to lose. Uh, her board was in full support and a number of them were there that day at that presentation. And I, I will say, in the interim, they had worked really hard, and as Dr. Odajima can attest, moving the needle on those numbers is, represents a lot of work. And they had brought a lot of their scores up, but under the refreshed system, it actually looked like their performance had gone down. Um, so they filed this suit. If you'll uh, see in the photos, our own Dr. Susan Kincannon uh, helped testify. So way to go, Dr. K there. Um, Midway has enjoyed school success for years upon years upon years, but it, it was really eye-opening to hear what this looks like in a human sense when our schools are not doing well. And another district that joined the suit was Del Valley ISD, and they had Samsung ready to come in and, and move a plant into Del Valley, and they were ready to just sign on the dotted line and, and go and bring jobs and revenue to the community. And then the, these ratings came out, and Samsung said, sorry, we're not gonna move into a community where the scores aren't good. That you know, Good schools are good for business. So just a lot of impact that we heard about. What, why we're here tonight is that this is an ongoing fight. The initial ruling found in favor of the schools, uh, Commissioner Marath is appealing that re ruling because as he says, there are only a small percentage of schools affected and he's referring to the number of school districts in the suit. I would note that that small percentage, as he says, represents over 100 communities and over 1 million Texas school children. Um, and I did just a couple of, of, of editorial remarks from me personally. I, I would wonder, I want to ask, what the purpose is of refreshing this very difficult and complex accountability system when it's still pretty much in its infancy. Um, I find it coincidental in the timing of, of this refreshment that it took place as we were right in the heat of the voucher debate. I want to ask if, if there was a political upside to if not purposely making um, Texas public schools look bad or at least make it harder for them to look good. And my final comment would be to say this, that when the power to make pivotal decisions with such significant consequences to how our public schools are measured and funded is concentrated in the hands of a few, then it becomes imperative for the many to come together and speak up for all. So those are my thoughts. I don't know if I can answer questions about the presentation, but if you have any additional questions or thoughts, I'll see what I can do. I don't have a question. I have some comments. Mm -hmm. You, yeah, out of a thousand school districts, there are only about 120 that have sued the state over this, the commissioner, only 120, so, you know, 10%-ish or so. But they represent collectively almost half of the students in the state of Texas, because it's almost 2 million mm -hmm. when you add them all up. So it's almost half the students in the state. I know when this first came out, Dr. Allen and I talked about it, and you know, happily, as Pam said, Midway didn't need to look at being a plaintiff in this lawsuit, but even though the number's not large, the districts that did represent a lot of students. Um, I think it's, um, it is important to support it, and so with that, I would move that the board adopt the resolution as presented and welcome other folks to discuss it, um, comment on it, um, or second the motion. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll add a few thoughts and I'll start by a second uh, to your motion. Um, you know, you're, you're right that this, this doesn't necessarily affect, you know, our, 
our schools, uh, how performance, how we did. Um, but uh, you know, and when I look at when I look at the resolution, um, for me it's two things. One is, I mean, a, a bedrock principle of of government of the people by the people and for the people has got to be legitimacy. And I think uh, I think. Um, everyone should expect that we're all playing by the same rules and we all know what those are when we start. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's just as true when we, you know, if you win as it is when you lose, right? You, it, it's just as true when, when, when this is a situation where we feel good about where we are um, because years down the road, we may not. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, you know, for me, it's not a question of, are we, are, are we a party to this or not? Clearly there's, we don't necessarily have a cause to sue specifically, but I do think, we should definitely stand up and say, let's let's make the rules the same. Let's make the rules fair, and let's know what they are when we go into this. Yes. Um, to me, the bigger the bigger thing is this last bullet point in the resolution, which is basically saying, hey, we we would love to reform this system so it does not rely so heavily on one standardized test. Let's let's find ways to do this to to make sure that our schools are doing what they need to do, our teachers are doing what they need to do. We're, we're holding boards accountable, and let's do it without relying on one standardized test that gets changed every two years. So mm -hmm. let's, uh, yeah, so f for me, that's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Colin. How will the resolution be used? I would assume that uh, it's going to be public to our community, obviously. I, we've not had any discussion about, you know, what do we do with it here, but the board acts on it in an open meeting. It's a, a public record. Anybody that wants to can, once it's executed, send a copy of it to whoever they want to, Mr. Paulus. Okay. I, I just want to make, just curious if there's any specific uh, usage that's going to go towards the, the ongoing legal action or anything like that. I mean, would it, uh, I mean, we're not filing it as part of a. No. Uh, Amicus, Amicus. 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 Yeah. yeah. No, but Sorry. I will. Will be. I've been asked to inform Dr. Perez what our vote was, and it will be added. You know, our, our we will be added to the list of districts that, that have filed past resolutions. So. Other questions, comments, discussion. If not, are y'all ready to vote? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank y'all. Thank you, Pam, for bringing this to us, along with all lots of information on it. I, so, I hope any, you got kind of the, 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 the personal vibe of, of how Dr. Perez rolls and, and, and where her values are oriented, and I was incredibly impressed with her and her board and uh, their willingness to, like she called the presentation mm -hmm. David versus Goliath. They, mm -hmm. That was it's a hard fight. But they I, were in the right. I, I should have let you second the motion. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually <laughs> want to have, have done my part, and I'm glad okay. to have here. Other Fair enough. Support All right. Consideration of personnel. Will you have anything to take up there? Yes, sir. That's a very good answer. Uh, superintendent's communications, then. So... Um, I, know, I know that we've been sitting here and we've received a lot of good information tonight, but I, I, well, I want to take just a minute or two and talk about Aaron Pena. Yeah. Dr. Pena will be joining Burn at CISD as the new superintendent effective on April 1. Um, he's not here this evening. Um, they've got, got business there. He's not on contract yet, but they're making some decisions and they've allowed him to sit in on a few things and voice opinions as necessary. So. He's, um, the transition has started. Um, you know, I was here with Aaron before. We were colleagues. We were both principals together. And I saw him once a month and a couple times here and there and whatever. But in the last year, we've been able to work shoulder to shoulder every day. Mm -hmm. And there are people in this room who can speak to Aaron better than I can. They have been in, with him longer and been around him more consistently. Um, but, but I want to tell you a little bit about what it is I think we're losing in an assistant superintendent and why I think this position is going to be so difficult to fill. He obviously has a ton of professional skills. You have to, to have achieved this level in a school district, especially one as excellent as Midway ISD. But the thing about Aaron that I think is the most clearly outstanding is that he's a rare combination of really rather extraordinary characteristics. Aaron is one of the kindest, 
most generous, most thoughtful individuals that you'll ever meet. And he's like that authentically into his core. Um, it would be easy to assume that because so much of what you see of Aaron is in public settings, that that's part of what he does to help him be an effective manager. And that's just not true. I, and when you're with Aaron one-on-one, -on -one, he's like that. When you're with him around his family, he's like that. He is as kind and as gracious a soul as you're ever gonna meet. But that is not rooted in weakness. He also has a strength of conviction, a set of core values and beliefs that he'll fight for and he'll defend. Most of those map back to his um, fearless belief in the ability of all students to be able to achieve. And I have also had Aaron get in my office and get kind of heated about things that he sees that aren't going well that he feels like we need to take on and tackle. Um, and so this is why I talk about it being a rare combination. There are a lot of people who are super kind and super gentle and very nice and frankly, it's because they, they don't have anything that they stand on. They're, they're actually relatively weak and this is how they manifest that. I also know people who have strength of conviction and have strong core values and they're hard to deal with. <laughs> they, they tend to sometimes be in love with their own voice. And Aaron is the, un, is the unusual blending of the two. He expresses extraordinary humility from strength. Mm -hmm. And man, if the world could use more of anything, it's people who know how to have a deep-seated set of values and beliefs and convictions, but also have the gentleness and humility to allow others to have the same. Mm -hmm. And we're going to miss him dearly. I, I've only been here a year, and the thought of him not being here every day is it causes me to miss him dearly. And I know others feel the same. And so uh, he's not here to hear any of this, but I didn't want the night to go by without me having a chance to just talk about what the last year working with Aaron's like and how extraordinarily proud I am of him from getting this opportunity to go serve Burnett CISD. Um, I've never rooted for Burnett in my life. I need to understand. <laughs> I need you to understand that when I was in Marble Falls, which is their neighbor, for those who don't know, their neighbor just to the north, well, you know, Josh, I... I got rid of everything green in my closet, just like I'm sure that you never bought purple. Like it wasn't allowed, and if you saw, they saw you in public, they'd tackle you and rip it off your body. And like I'm like the Burnett Bulldogs, we call them the bull puppies. Like we did not like them, okay? <laughs> but um, as of April one, I'm a Burnett Bulldog fan. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I hope that in the coming days you'll have opportunities to text, call, and reach out to Aaron and let you know how much you appreciate him, because he has served this district exceptionally well for a long time. We were at lunch with him today. I'm wrapping up, I promise. And listening to Pat talk about raising their kids in this school district. Y'all people spending that much time in, in one place for as long as he has is unusual anymore. And so it's very special and it's very sweet and I'm proud of what he gets to do. But the district's, the district's losing a good one. And he's losing, we're losing Patricia No, no, we get well. to keep her, right? No. <laughs> They hired a great teacher and they're taking the superintendent as part of the Yeah. <laughs> I, I know how that goes, by the way. I was going to say, didn't we do that? Yeah. Yeah, we did that. Tag along. Well, I think a lot, a lot the same of, of what you've said could be said about his wife as well. Absolutely. She's highest caliber character. I love working with them. Well said, sir, and I won't belabor the point other than to just echo your comments yeah. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, anything okay. further? No, sir. All right, then. We're out of agenda items. Thank you all for being here. We are adjourned. Before you cut out of here, let me... I mean, it's dark in the fourth term. Yeah. All right, everybody run! Oh, yeah, yeah.